Chapter Six of A Daughter of Today by Sarah Jeanette Duncan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. If Lucien had examined Miss Bell's work during the week of her experiment with Anglo Parisian journalism, he would have observed that it grew gradually worse as the days went on the devotion of the small hours to composition does not steady one's hand for the reproduction of the human muscles or inform one's eye as to the correct manipulation of flesh tints besides the model suffered in elfrida's hands from an unconscious diminution of enthusiasm she was finding her first serious attempt at writing more absorbing than she would have believed possible and she felt that she was doing it better than she expected she was hardly aware of the moments that slipped by while she dabbled aimlessly in unconsidered colour meditating a phrase or leaned back and let nothing interfere with her consideration of the atelier with the other reproductive instinct she did not recognize the deterioration in her work either and at the very moment when nadi palichki observing lucien's neglect of her inwardly called him a brute elfrida was planning to leave the atelier an hour earlier for the sake of the more urgent thing which she had to do she finished it in five days and addressed it to frank park with a new and uplifting sense of accomplishment the ever-fresh miracle happened to her too in that the working out of one article begot the possibilities of half a dozen more and the next day saw her well into another in posting the first she had a premonition of success she saw it as it would infallibly appear in a conspicuous place in raffini's chronicle and heard the people of the american colony wondering who in the world could have written it she conceived that it would fill about two columns and a half on saturday afternoon when kendall joined her crossing the courtyard of the atelier she was preoccupied with the form of her rebuff to any inquiries that might be made as to whether she had written it they walked on together talking casually of usual things kendall glancing every now and then at the wet study elfrida was carrying home felt himself distinctly thankful that she did not ask his opinion of it as she had to his embarrassment once or twice before though it was so very bad that he was half disposed to abuse it without permission miss bell seemed persistently interested in other things however the theatres the ecclesiastical bill before the chamber of deputies the new ambassador even the recent improvement of the police system kendall found her almost tiresome his half-interested replies interpreted themselves to her after a while and she turned their talk upon trivialities with a gay exhilaration which was not her frequent mood she asked him to come up when they arrived with a frank cordiality which he probably thought of as the american way he went up at all events and for the twentieth time admired the dainty chic of the little apartment telling himself also for the twentieth time that it was extraordinary how agreeable it was to be there agreeable with a distinctly local agreeableness whether its owner happened to be also there or not in this he was altogether sincere and only properly discriminating he spent fifteen minutes wondering at her whimsical interest and when she suddenly asked him if he really thought the race had outgrown its physical conditions he got up to go declaring it was too bad she must have been working up back numbers of the nineteenth century at which she consented to turn their talk into its usual personal channel and he sat down again content doesn't the princess bobeloff write a charming hand elfrida said presently tossing him a square white envelope it isn't hers if it's an invitation she has a wretched relation of a frenchwoman living with her who does all that may i light a cigarette you know you may it is an invitation but i didn't accept her soiree last night if i'd known you had been asked i should have missed you 
i ought to tell you elfrida went on coloring a little that i was invited through leila van camp that ridiculously rich girl you know they say lucien is in love with the van camp has been affecting me a good deal lately she says my manners are so pleasing and besides lucien once told her she painted better than i did the princess is a great friend of hers why didn't you go kendall asked without any appreciable show of curiosity if he had been looking closely enough he would have seen that she was waiting for his question oh it lies somehow that sort of thing outside my idea of life i have nothing to say to it and it has nothing to say to me kendall smiled introspectively he saw why he had been shown the letter and yet he said i venture to hope that if we had met there we might have had some little conversation elfrida leaned back in her chair and threw up her head locking her slender fingers over her knee of course she said indifferently i understand why you should go you must you have arrived at a point where the public claims a share of your personality that's different kendall's face straightened out he was too much of an englishman to understand that a personally agreeable truth might not be flattery and elfrida never knew how far he resented her candour when it took the liberty of being gracious i went in the humble hope of getting a good supper and seeing some interesting people he told her loti was there and madame rive chanlet and sergeant and the supper miss bell inquired with a touch of sarcasm disappointing he returned seriously i should say bad as bad as possible she gave him an impatient glance but those people loti and the rest it is only a serio-comic game to them to go to the princess bobeloff's they wouldn't if they could help it they don't live their real lives in such places among such people kendall took the cigarette from his mouth and laughed your bohemianism is quite arcadian in its quality deliciously fresh he declared i think they do genius clings to respectability after a time a most worthy and admirable lady the princess elfrida raised the arch of her eyebrows much too worthy and admirable she declared and talked of something else leaving kendall rasped as she sometimes did without being in any degree aware of it how preposterous it is he said moved by his irritation to find something preposterous that girls like miss van camp should come here to work they can't help being rich it shows at least the germ of a desire to work out their own salvation i think i like it it shows the germ of an affectation in rather an advanced stage of development i give her three months more to tire of snubbing lucien and distributing caramels to the less fortunate young ladies of the studio then she will pick up those pitiful attempts of hers and take them to new york and spend a whole season in glorious apology for them elfrida looked at him steadily for an instant then she laughed lightly thanks she said i see you had not forgotten my telling you that lucien said she painted better than i did kendall wondered whether he had really meant to go so far i am sorry he said but i am afraid i had not forgotten it well you would not say it out of ill-nature you must have wanted me to know what you thought i think he said gravely that i did at all events that i do want you to know it seems a pity that you should work on here mistakenly when there are other things that you could do so well other things have been mentioned to me before she returned with a strain in her voice that she tried to banish may i ask what particular thing occurs to you he was already remorseful 
after all what business of his was it to interfere especially when he knew that she attached such absurd importance to his opinion i hardly know he said but there must be something i am convinced that there is something elfrida put her elbows on a little table and shadowed her face with her hands i wish i could understand she said why i should be so willing to to go on at any sacrifice if there is no hope in the end kendall's mood of grim frankness overcame him again i believe i know he said watching her her hand dropped from her face and she turned it towards him mutely it is not achievement you want but success that is why said he there was silence for a moment broken by light footsteps on the stair and a knock my good friends cried mademoiselle palichki from the doorway have you been quarrelling she made a little dramatic gesture to match her words which brought out every line of a black velvet and white corduroy dress which would have been a horror upon an englishwoman upon nadie palichki it was simply an admiration point of the kind never seen out of paris and its effect was instantaneous kendall acknowledged it with a bow of exaggerated deference c'est parfait he said with humility and lifted a pile of newspapers off the nearest chair for her nadie stood still pouting monsieur is amused she said monsieur is always amused but i have that to tell which monsieur will graciously take au grand sérieux what is it nadie elfrida asked with something like dread in her voice nadie's air was so important so rejoiceful écoutez donc i am to send two pictures to the salon carolo durand has already seen my sketch for one and he says there is not a doubt not a doubt that it will be considered your congratulations both of you or your heart's blood for on my word of honour i did not expect it this year a thousand and one cried kendall trying not to see elfrida's face but if you did not expect it this year mademoiselle you were the only one who had so little knowledge of affairs he added gaily and now nadie cried as if he had interrupted her i am going to drive in the bois to see what it will be like when the people in the best carriages turn and say that is mademoiselle nadie palichki whose picture has just been bought for the luxembourg she paused and looked for a curious instant at elfrida and then went quickly up behind her chair embrasse moi chérie she said bringing her face with a bird-like motion close to the other girl kendall saw an instinctive momentary aversion in the backward start of elfrida's head and from the bottom of his heart he was sorry for her she pushed her friend away almost violently no she said no i am sorry but it is too childish we never kiss each other you and i and listen nadie i am delighted for you but i have a sick headache la migraine you understand and you must go away both of you both of you her voice raised itself in the last few words to an almost hysterical imperativeness as they went down the stairs together mademoiselle palichki remarked to mr john kendall repentant of the good that he had done so she has consulted her oracle and it has barked out the truth let us hope she will not throw herself into the seine oh no kendall replied she is horridly hurt but i am glad to believe that she hasn't the capacity for tragedy somebody he added gloomily ought to have told her long ago half an hour later the postman brought elfrida a letter from mr frank park and a packet containing her manuscript it was a long letter very kind and appreciative of the article which mr park called bright and gossipy and if anything too cleverly unconventional in tone 
he did not take the trouble to criticize it seriously and left elfrida under the impression that from his point of view at least it had no faults mr park had offered the article to raffini but while they might have printed it upon his recommendation it appeared that even his recommendation could not induce them to promise to pay for it and it was a theory with him that what was worth printing was invariably worth paying for so he returned the manuscript to its author in the sincere hope that it might yet meet its deserts he had been thinking over the talk they had had together and he saw more plainly than ever the hopelessness of her getting a journalistic start in paris however he would distinctly advise her to try london instead there were a number of ladies papers published in london he regretted that he did not know the editors of any of them and amongst them with her freshness of style she would be sure to find an opening mr park added the address of a lodging-house off fleet street where elfrida would be in the thick of it and the fact that he was leaving paris for three months or so he hoped she would write to him when he came back it was a letter precisely calculated to draw an unsophisticated amateur mind away from any other mortification to pour balm upon any unrelated wound elfrida felt herself armed by it to face a sea of troubles not absolutely but almost she convinced herself on the spot that her solemn choice of an art had been immature and to some extent groundless and unwarrantable and she washed all her brushes with a mechanical and melancholy sense that it was for the last time it was easier than she would have dreamed for her to decide to take frank park's advice and go to london the life of the quartier had already vaguely lost in charm since she knew that she must be irredeemably a failure in the atelier though she told herself with a hot tear or two that no one loved it better more comprehendingly than she did her impulse was to begin packing at once but she put that off until the next day and wrote two or three letters instead one was to john kendall this is the whole of it please believe me very grateful for your frankness this afternoon i have been most curiously blind but i agree with you that there is something else and i am going away to find it out and to do it when i succeed i will let you know but you shall not tell me that i have failed again elfrida bell the other was addressed to her mother and when it reached mr and mrs bell in sparta they said it was certainly sympathetic and very well written this was to disarm one another's mind of the suspicion that its closing paragraph was doubtfully daughterly in view of what are now your very limited resources i am sure dear mother you will understand my unwillingness to make an additional drain upon them as i should do if i followed your wishes and came home i am convinced of my ability to support myself and i am not coming home to avoid giving you the pain of repeating your request and the possibility of your sending me money which you cannot afford to spare i have decided not to let you know my whereabouts until i can write to you that i am in an independent position i will only say that i am leaving paris and no letters sent to this address will be forwarded i sincerely hope you will not allow yourself to be in any way anxious about me for i assure you that there is not the slightest need with much love to papa and yourself always your affectionate daughter elfrida p s i hope your asthma has again succumbed to dr paley End of chapter 6